Hello, and thank you so much for joining me. Today I'm going to share information about the importance of proactive crisis planning in the school setting for children with mental health challenges. This is part one of a two-part winter series. Please be sure to sign up for part two, our live question and answer discussion. You can submit your questions to me at the email provided in this video. After you have attended both part one and part two, you will receive an email survey asking about the presentation and a certificate of attendance. Please do take a few minutes to give us your feedback on this new format we are trying out. We hope that splitting this into two parts allows you more flexibility to watch the presentation portion at a time that works best for you to receive the information you need to advocate for the children in your life, but also to have that opportunity to connect with our advocates. My name is Laura Jean and I'm a parent advocate and the coordinator of the Children's Mental Health and Emotional or Behavioral Disorders Project. I have a background in child psychology and public affairs. I've worked with and on behalf of children and families for over 20 years and have been at Pacer Center since 2018. I am also the parent of two youths ages 12 and 14, both who have very different disabilities and mental health needs. First, we are going to talk about what do we mean by crisis and wellness. We will also discuss what developing a crisis plan based on the principles of wellness, recovery, and resiliency looks like in the school setting. Last, we will address how the individual education program, positive behavior, and crisis plans can help support children with mental health needs. First, let's define crisis and wellness and talk about what both of those look like for children and youth with mental health needs and behavior challenges. When we hear the word crisis, what images come to mind? Depending on our personal experiences and perhaps our professional training, we may have very different opinions of what constitutes a crisis. A crisis situation is also defined for us in different settings. Schools have developed a student code of conduct and other rules that specifically outline the expected behavior of the student population. When a student's behavior violates those rules, it may be considered a crisis and consequences are put into place to address that violation. In the community, we have laws govern our behaviors and when those laws are not followed, it may be considered a crisis that results in legal consequences. Even at home, we have unwritten limits and behavioral expectations that when violated may be considered a crisis that needs immediate response and sometimes consequences. Whatever your understanding of what a crisis is, most of us agree that a crisis situation includes a safety concern or risk that needs to be addressed right away. I put this quote here by NAMI, the National Alliance on Mental Illness. A mental health crisis is any situation in which a person's behavior puts them at risk of hurting themselves or others, or prevents them from being able to care for themselves or function effectively in the community. That could include verbal or physical aggression, but keep in mind crisis situations could also arise when we have a youth who is completely withdrawn. Typically, when we get calls for a student who is school avoidant or having difficulty getting to or staying at school, who may be withdrawing from family and friends and enjoyed activities, that can at times also be considered a crisis situation. We know for school staff, ensuring the physical safety of students is paramount, but we also don't want to overlook that there are other situations that might be considered a crisis, especially when we have students who are withdrawing and unable to care for themselves as they otherwise would outside of that situation or who are not functioning well in the community. The challenge in determining a crisis level behavior, other than one that impacts the safety of a child or youth or others around them, is that it can be difficult to predict, intermittent or recurring, and may escalate gradually or be sudden in intensity and frequency. So these are some of the challenges and identifiers when we are talking about a crisis situation. When I'm talking about escalating behaviors, this could look like any number of things, and this is by no means an exhaustive list of what those behaviors could look like. How many of us have been around a child or youth who exhibits any one or more of these behaviors? Probably all of us. These escalating behaviors that are not responding to typical interventions, casual or more informal supports, supports, supportive gestures or comments could mean there is an unmet need. 
So take a second to review these behaviors and think about how you feel when you see this kind of behavior and can't stop the escalation of that behavior despite your best intentions. And the reason I want you to think about how you feel is because the way we feel about behavior and the way we understand it influences how we respond. In school, these behaviors can have a significant impact on performance. It can decrease school engagement or for older students, increase their risk of dropping out or getting involved in the justice system. So that is why it's so important to be proactive in addressing the behaviors and unmet needs. In a crisis, a child or youth is relying on others to help them. So how we respond to them matters. While their behaviors may feel and look threatening, the child or youth needs to know they have an adult who has their back and can make decisions and work in support of their recovery and return to wellness. Children and youth are also very resilient. They can recover probably more quickly than adults can from extreme situations that threaten their well-being or the well-being of others. And when they are in the recovery, those are the moments when we can help them process that situation and do some problem solving. Children will be resilient when the important adults in their lives believe in them unconditionally and hold them to high expectations. Unconditional belief in a child does not mean we do not hold them accountable. It really means that the adults in their lives are not going anywhere and will help guide, instruct, and support children, even during their most difficult times, so that they can feel security and confidence. Then when the crisis is over, the child or youth is once again able to make healthy and safe decisions for themselves. There are a lot of different approaches that take on different principles of wellness and recovery. These five key recovery concepts are from the work of Dr. Mary Ellen Copeland, founder of the Wellness Recovery Action Plan, or RAP for short. These are based on years of research that finds mental health recovery has several key components for people that have mental health or emotional difficulties. What we wanna pay attention to and strengthen is the child or youth's ability to have access to and use these keys, which include the following, hope, personal responsibility, education, self-advocacy, and support. If we can increase our understanding of these concepts, it is likely to help us when working with a child or youth and to strengthen their resiliency and recovery and reduce the frequency or intensity of disruptive and crisis behaviors. What exactly is wellness? The Federal Substance Abuse and Mental Health Service Administration, SAMHSA, defines wellness. And I like this definition because it's a holistic approach to what keeps us healthy, both physically and mentally recognizing there is a connection between the two. So they see it as not the absence of disease, illness, and stress, but as the presence of a positive purpose in life, satisfying work and play, joyful relationships, a healthy body, living environment, and happiness. Today, as we talk about children and youth who may be struggling with their mental health, I want you to hold on to that idea of what wellness is. So wellness in youth might look something like this. Things are going well for Shauna and Jaden. They are participating in positive things they enjoy. Their moods are typical for them. They are getting along with others and have positive daily routines. I want you to remember these two and we will revisit them later. The first principle is hope. It is hard to feel good when you're feeling hopeless. Children and teens need to have something to enjoy, need to find some sense of success, and to feel that things can get better. The belief that recovery is real provides the essential and motivating message of a better future, that people can and do overcome the internal and external challenges, barriers, and obstacles that confront them. Hope is internalized and can be fostered by peers, families, providers, allies, and others. Hope is the catalyst of the recovery process. The second concept we wanna focus on today is personal responsibility. So personal responsibility in crisis planning is about helping the child understand how their words and actions may have impacted others and to ask for effort to work on the skills necessary for growth and greater independence. Children and youth want to be successful. 
so including them in plans to provide the right level of support as they build those skills is critical to fostering that growth. Developing those skills when a child is not in crisis is part of a proactive planning approach. But I like the idea of personal responsibility because it's also a role adults can take on by modeling that behavior. As the adult, it's important we ask what role we play in escalating behaviors. Are we not addressing some unmet need? It's also important we talk to the child about what things we can do differently in the future. We can also work to be mindful that we think positively about the instructions and directions we give. So instead of saying things like, stop standing on the table, we might say, please put your feet on the floor, making it very clear what desired behavior and response you are asking them to do. It's also important we help children and youth understand the connection between what they are feeling and experiencing and their mental health needs. Sometimes that starts with education. For example, we often see IEP goals related to helping a child learn to self-regulate. But when a child is not making progress on that goal, sometimes we have to back up and ask, is the child or youth able to identify their different emotions and how their body feels when they experience anger, frustration, embarrassment, fear, sadness, or even more positive feelings of excitement that can sometimes become too intense and lead to disruptive behaviors. Has the child learned strategies they can use to regulate and keep calm? Are they able to access those strategies independently, or do they need prompting and modeling to first co-regulate? Letting the child know you will work with them to help figure out what their needs are and how to best get those needs met in appropriate ways can help build the trust and buy-in you need to help prevent disruptive behaviors and de-escalate more quickly. The fourth principle is self-advocacy. If a child has a better understanding of what works for them and what doesn't work for them, they are better able to self-advocate. By helping a child or youth learn more about their mental health disorder and how it might be impacting their ability to manage their emotions, as well as helping them practice identifying their needs and different strategies, we are providing the opportunity through modeling to teach them how to self-advocate and tell us what we can do as adults to help support them. And the fifth principle of recovery is support. Parents and teachers can work together to create and foster a sense of community. School success for children and youth is linked to feeling they belong and are valued members of the community. Students' perceptions of feeling accepted, respected, and supported by peers and teachers is linked to their attention, effort, and persistence. When families reach out to us, all too often they report their child or youth does not have anyone at school they trust to go to for help, or they may not feel they have friends around them who understand them, or there is one trusted adult, but they are not always available. How do we help a child feel supported when they are new to a school, or there has been a situation that has caused strain to those relationships, or they don't feel they have a safe place to be in school? Fostering positive peer relationships and trusting relationships with adults at school can help change a child's perspective and give them the support and motivation they need to keep building their skills to manage emotions that get in the way of accessing their academic instruction. Youth need to know who can support, how they can support, and when they can support. Ensuring there is a group of trusted adults a child feels they can go to for help to address some of these issues before they rise to a crisis level is critical. They also need a place or places in the school they feel safe. So let's talk more about what effective crisis planning looks like and what proactive crisis planning is in this next section. What do we mean by proactive crisis planning? It is critically important to have a written plan that ensures that everyone is on the same page about the strategies and supports needed when a child is in crisis. As you plan to meet to discuss how to support a specific child when they experience a crisis situation, you might want to plan to discuss things like, what specifically does the child look like when they are in crisis? 
and that could be everything from noticing a youth has their head down on their desk most of the day to a child who is increasingly out of their seat or classroom or a youth who is refusing to do the work and becoming disruptive to others. Discuss whatever that looks like for that student. It is important that you are as specific as you can be as the team works together to do some crisis planning. If we can catch those early warning signs about what a child looks like as they become dysregulated and may be heading into a crisis, we can learn to intervene earlier and hopefully prevent those behaviors or de-escalate more quickly. The team should identify and document the youth's escalating behaviors as well as when it constitutes a crisis, where they are no longer really in control and they need someone to provide guidance and support to help de-escalate and get their needs met in appropriate, safe ways and get back on track. What steps will be taken next? How can adults help a child regain control in a way that is positive and supportive? If restrictive procedures, physical holds or seclusion are a concern, it will be important to include a goal that the crisis plan will reduce the likelihood for the need to use those procedures. I just wanna take a moment to let parents know and remind those who work with children at the school, anytime those restrictive procedures are used two times within 30 days, it's a requirement that the IEP team come together and try to figure out what they can do or try differently to reduce the likelihood that those restrictive procedures will be needed again. So if this has been a challenge for your child or a child you have worked with, again, the proactive piece of this is meeting to talk about how the team will work to ensure the right supports are in place. Part of the proactive crisis plan might also include a communication plan to email or have phone conversations or regularly scheduled meetings so everyone can stay connected and work through issues as they arise, but before they spiral out of control. One of the other goals I hope you take away today is how to understand that crisis planning is an important component in wellness and recovery. Finding a way to address individually determined crisis level behavior can be challenging. A successful crisis plan is not created out of thin air or only when needed. It takes deliberate consideration of the child or youth's specific and individualized needs. Coming prepared to a meeting to discuss crisis level behaviors and how to keep them from escalating takes relevant, meaningful, and current information. And it takes information from a variety of different people who may experience these crisis level situations in different ways and who may be viewing those behaviors in different ways. It is easier to just respond with authority to get the situation under control. But if we are proactive in planning, we can respond with empathy or redirection with the hope that de-escalation will come more quickly. Before that meeting, it's important to consider how you currently view the child or youth's behavior. Remember that others at the table may have different ideas about what is driving the behavior and how to address them. And be prepared to share your experience with your child or the child you work with and be willing to listen to the perspective of others because that's where we really see the most effective crisis planning. Ask yourself, does the behavior frighten you? Does it challenge your authority? Do you feel disrespected? Again, how we perceive what we see is a strong motivator for how we respond to what we are experiencing. It may take courage and determination to be willing to consider looking at those challenging behaviors in a new and different way. It may also meet with resistance from others around you who are unwilling to consider that when a child's behaviors result in a crisis, this may not reflect failure on the part of the youth or the child. I just wanna to touch briefly on PBIS, but for more information, I'd encourage you to visit our website. Many youth that have disruptive behaviors in school will already have a behavior plan or hopefully a positive behavior support plan that outlines some of the triggers and replacement skills they are working on with that youth. Positive behavior intervention supports is a process of planning and problem solving that includes direct teaching of social behaviors, much like you would teach academics. The basic PBIS approach is to use proactive research-based strategies to teach clearly defined behavioral expectations. Research shows that when a school environment is positive and predictable, students feel safe, 
have better academic performance and make better behavior choices. PBIS also leads to a reduction of in and out of school suspensions and discipline referrals. For youth who have disruptive behaviors that escalate, creating a safety concern, the team may also add a crisis or safety plan that gets more specific about how to support that youth to prevent dangerous behaviors, help them de-escalate, and work to prevent a crisis. There are many different names for written plans that can be developed to help children or youth who are at risk of or in need of a written plan to support their crisis level behavior. That plan might be called a crisis plan, a crisis prevention plan, a crisis management plan, or even a safety plan. No matter what you title the plan, there are some key features that should be in a successful plan. It should be a fluid plan that is actively developed implemented, reviewed, and revised as needed with the child or youth. It should include a designated person to facilitate, review, update, and write the plan. It should be person-centered and include the child or youth's input, including strengths, needs, and what works and what doesn't. And again, this kind of goes back to that principle of self-advocacy. We really want to include the child, no matter their age, to whatever ability they are able to communicate with us about what's working and what's not working. To promote that principle of recovery, that they are able to self-advocate for themselves, to be listened to, and to have adults take seriously what they identify as their needs. Most crisis plans include basic information that identifies the child, such as the legal name, age, family address, parent or guardian name, and date of birth. It may also include how the child or youth prefers to be addressed by others if different than their legal name and their preferred pronouns. Additionally, important medical information, including diagnoses, medications, allergies, and the names of doctors and their contact numbers will often be included in plans. Plans that are recovery-based will include what a child looks like when they are not in crisis, it's really important for us to be able to identify what does a child look like when they are feeling well, because when we know what they look like when they are feeling well, we can start to identify those early warning signs that maybe they aren't well or something is going on and they need some additional support. Crisis plans use clear language to explain signs that a child is in crisis as well as signs of when a child is no longer in crisis and no longer needs the extra supports and interventions. They also include clear steps that will be taken through the process of a crisis to help. It can also be critically important to note what does not help a child at crisis and what might further escalate behavior. If a child is triggered by being touched by someone when they are escalated, this is an example of helpful information that might be written into a plan of what not to do during a crisis. As adults, a lot of time we like to help by talking through things and for some kids, that may be something that is not helpful. No matter how kind and empathetic we approach that, it can be too much information for them to process. So think about not just what works well to support the child, but what we also know doesn't work, and make sure to include that in the plan and share the plan with all of those who might be working with that child so that plan can be implemented with consistency. If that same child does better when someone gives short, clear, verbal explanations of what is happening each step through a crisis, this might be an example of what to do during a crisis. Crisis plans also include who to contact or involve, and when, or in some cases, who not to contact if certain individuals may be challenging for a youth at times of crisis. Remember Shauna and Jaden? Well, things haven't been going well for them and you can see how this impacts them at home and in school. Without appropriate interventions, these two may continue to escalate, falling behind and failing classes, or getting into fights at school, self-medicating, etc. One way to start understanding why behaviors reach a point of escalation is to understand the progression. That may start with how does the child or youth look and act when feeling stable and able to cope with a variety of daily stressors, to how does that same child present when they are dysregulated and incapable of handling situations. Most children and youth do not start their day planning to be in crisis. 
unmet needs, unresolved issues, and sometimes unexpected triggers can escalate into crisis level behaviors without warning. We know with some kids we can see things unfolding and may be able to recognize smaller behaviors that tell us they may be struggling to regulate, allowing us to respond and help support them with positive feedback, checking for understanding, or redirecting to use a strategy known to help. But for some youth, those triggers can be sudden and difficult to predict. That's why, again, it's so important to go back and think about what are some of those stressors that might be getting in the way and causing those difficult behaviors. These are examples of questions that you can ask when trying to understand the function of a child's individualized needs and possible stressors. Is the behavior a response to something in the environment causing the child to escalate? It might not be something we know or have thought about, but it's important to ask the question. Do we notice there is something similar happening at a certain time of the day or related to a certain subject? Is it in a noisy environment or is it outside at recess or other less structured times of the day? Is it in response to an unmet need? Is it a response to difficulty with academic tasks? It could be an automatic or involuntary response. Children and youth may not understand why. It could be a child that has trauma in their past and something is triggering them, and that might just be their flight, fight, or freeze response. And for those kids, that is really an involuntary response. Is there something going on in the school setting that is influenced by the child's culture that they are not understanding? or have different beliefs around? Is it influenced by the child's physical health or disability? Or is it due to other life experiences, loss, poverty, traumatic events that are potentially causing and triggering those behaviors? When a child isn't feeling well, we may start to see escalation of some of these more negative behaviors and responses. I'm pretty sure everyone here has seen all of these with the youth you work with or care for from time to time. Oftentimes they are short-lived and respond to simple redirection or consequences. But for youth with mental health needs, these types of behaviors may be significant enough to prevent them from being able to access their education. Many of the barriers to effective crisis planning are challenges schools face for the many types of support and I'm sure none of these barriers come as a surprise to anyone here, especially over the last couple of years. A lack of staff really limits the ability to provide that kind of individualized support and planning that's needed to be very proactive supporting kids at school. Some staff also report they need additional training and resources. Some less obvious barriers include writing and implementing crisis plans that build on individual needs based on the principles of wellness that often takes coordination across different service providers and agencies and planning for gaps in those services that might occur with staffing changes or life changes for the child. Before we think about what behavior interventions look like, I want to take some time to talk about our basic assumptions that inform our discussions around behaviors. First, we need to believe that behavior has meaning. To better understand the behavior, we must understand that it has meaning. Think about some of your own behaviors. Do you honk the car horn when a driver hits their brakes unexpectedly? Most of us do. But do you honk your car horn when everyone around you is driving safely? No. What are you communicating to that driver that hits their brakes? Second, behavior is an attempt to communicate an unmet need. Remember what that behavior looks like does not necessarily tell us what that unmet need is. We need to figure out what that unmet need is and respond to that and not to the behavior. For example, an anxious child's thinking is often unrealistic and overly pessimistic. An anxious child might be saying things like, I know I can't get 100% on this test, so why should I even try? If we respond to the anxious child that we know they are smart and can do the work, that will likely increase their anxiety because the need isn't about getting 100% on the test. The need is being driven by the fear of not doing well. And that fear may be well grounded in real time, like not being in class enough to get the instruction needed to understand what they are being tested on, or perhaps an undiscovered learning need. So we need to understand the meaning of the behavior 
in order to respond effectively. In this case, extra instruction to fill those gaps of learning time or special instruction in math or reading or whatever is being tested may best meet the child's need to reduce their anxiety. Remember, a child is not likely to be changing their behavior, especially if it works for them. If eloping out of the classroom or becoming disruptive gets them sent out of the classroom so that they miss the academic activity that they struggle with, imposing consequences may not prevent the behaviors from recurring. And again, remember the importance of building those trusted relationships as that will be key in helping that child co-regulate, self-regulate, and self-advocate to meet their needs and manage behaviors. There are other basic assumptions about behavior, and this is where interpretation of another person's behavior and how they respond to your support can get difficult. We all have our own certain ideas about what behavior means based on our own behavior and behavior expectations. If as a teacher or school staff person, I see a child violating a school rule, I am more apt to think the child just won't follow the rules rather than they can't. Sometimes even when we have information about the child, we first consider consequences rather than positive support to address the behavior. We all also have different ideas about what causes behaviors, and that may lead to very different kinds of interventions. A teacher who has grown up with an anxious sibling or parent may have more insights than one who has not had that exposure. The training we may have had in our professional lives may impact how we manage or work to change behavior. While not one way is right or wrong, it is important to keep these basic assumptions in mind as we view the impact that a child's disability has on behavior and school success. Again, remember, when the behaviors are meeting a need, there is no incentive to change those behaviors. A child may continue to use a behavior even if it is maladaptive. A couple of other important considerations. When thinking about developing a crisis plan, take time to first consider this. Instead of asking, why won't the child or youth do the preferred behavior? Consider first, why can't the child or youth do the preferred behavior? Reframing this simple question might help you think about the behavior as communication for an unmet need. It also leads us to think first about how to support or instruct a child or youth to use a replacement behavior that helps them get that need met. It may help us respond by being instructive and supportive rather than falling back on consequences and punishment. As an adult, it's difficult for me to feel like there is something I can do if I'm assuming I have a child in front of me who just won't do something. But if I ask the question, why can't they? It's inviting me as an adult to intervene in some way. Remind yourself behavior is communication. Behavior has meaning. Therefore, it only makes sense we need to understand the meaning of the behavior in order to most effectively respond to it. If we want to move away from the negative trajectory that disruptive behaviors create, we need to develop plans that are more proactive and less reactive. We need to remember to include what a child looks like when they are well to be able to better identify those subtle signs they are beginning to struggle so we can intervene earlier to prevent challenging behaviors and crisis situations. Shifting a bit to think about our assumptions around autonomy. Many of you are likely caring for or working with children who qualify as having a disability either under federal special education law, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act IDEA, or Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973, which is a federal civil rights law that bars discrimination against people with disabilities and requires any government agency or any organization that receives federal funding to provide access to their programs and spaces. Students that qualify as having a disability under either of these laws have the right to accommodations, modifications, interventions, and services that will allow them to access and benefit from their education. Remember that part of being well includes feeling safe. Students who do not feel physically safe or emotionally safe may not be able to benefit from their education. Providing consistent structure and boundaries with clear rules and expectations is another important way we help children feel safe. 
Finding the right balance of boundaries and student choice that match with their ability will support wellness and developing autonomy. Too many rules, though, can lead to children feeling powerless, so you may want to consider including children in creating some of the rules. These rules may help with external controls in a school setting to keep students safe, but they do not teach the pro-social behaviors all students need to create environments that feel safe. Research has shown that students with disabilities are more likely than their non-disabled peers to be bullied, and that bullying is more likely in settings that rely on better supervision alone. A student's perception of teachers' autonomy supportive teaching around anti-bullying behaviors provides youth with what they need to internalize positive values and expectations. A teacher or staff member's ability to take on the student's perspective and provide a meaningful rationale that is relevant to the student's strengths, interests, and goals is important in affecting behaviors. It is also true that many students with mental health needs may struggle with perspective taking, responding appropriately and proportionately to interactions with peers and adults. In tense situations, it may be difficult to understand the child's perspective and give them the empathy but it is important to validate the child's thoughts, feelings, and perspectives. We are not in their shoes, but when the child or youth knows you truly care and are trying to understand them and encourage them to make positive choices through their day, we are providing necessary opportunities for autonomy and wellness. Validation does not mean agreement, but it does pave the way for working together, building trust, and finding compromises. How do we support autonomy when working with children and youth to create positive behavior and crisis plans? Let's talk briefly about person-centered principles. These principles are based on person-centered thinking, which is a philosophy in working with someone who has a disability using tools and planning in a way that helps give positive control and self-direction to that person. For a child or youth whose challenging behaviors escalate, they may feel a loss of control and this can in turn make it more challenging for them to avoid a crisis or reduce the impact a crisis has on self and others. For this reason, I want to give you a brief overview of person-centered principles that I thought might be very helpful to you when planning and working with a child or youth who experiences escalating behaviors. The first person-centered principle is, people have a clear and shared appreciation of the talents and capacities of the focused person. Some examples of what this could look like in a behavior or crisis plan might be adding a picture, interests, and strengths of the child, as well as including what the child is like when not in a crisis to remind others that the youth is not the escalated behaviors being addressed in the time of disruption or crisis. You might also want to consider looking at PACER's student snapshot as a template for introducing a child to others and to remind others during a crisis of this youth's hopes dreams, strengths, and challenges. Two, people have a common understanding of what the focused person wants. In the plan, consider how to include information about what the child does and does not want when they are experiencing escalating behaviors. Three, the group involved agrees to meet regularly to review activities, which is important in allowing a child or youth a chance to be heard, provide feedback, talk about what's working and not working, and consider what's important to and for them. The fourth example of person-centered principles has to do with including an individual in the group who will assure that the individual's interests are being met. This includes ensuring that the child or youth is involved in the planning process and the implementation of the plan. Fifth, this is an ongoing process as the child or youth grows and changes. What does recovery and resiliency look like for Shauna and Jaden? So as parents and teachers, and I am as guilty of this as anyone, our first response to some of the behaviors we've seen in Shauna and Jaden might very well be consequences for skipping school, rude behavior, or unfinished schoolwork. And depending on the youth, that may work, or at least work in the short term. But it isn't likely to address the myriad of behaviors we see or the need behind the behavior. One way I work to be a better adult is to ask myself, am I responding or reacting to my children? And I can tell you that is a work in progress. 
So what is going on with Shauna and Jaden that contributed to them going from doing and being well to struggling? Sitting down and talking with the child or youth and reaching out to parent or teachers for some feedback will allow you to gather some information to help you understand the triggers. It turns out Shauna was being bullied for being in special education classes by another student who had been welcomed into her friend group. This led to her feeling displaced and increased her anxiety about her disabilities, friends, and school. Notifying the school about the situation, staff were able to intervene, help stop the bullying, and help Shauna reconnect with her friends and get caught up on her work. Jaden was doing so well in school, he was moved to a more challenging math class that then felt too difficult and he began quickly falling behind because he was embarrassed to ask for help. To make matters worse, he stopped taking his medications because he believed he shouldn't need them and thought none of his friends took medication. His parents were able to intervene and begin providing him some education about the role medication can play in supporting wellness. Working with the IEP team, they were able to add in a few simple accommodations to check in with Jaden to make sure he understands the work so he can get help before he becomes frustrated and just gives up or becomes disrespectful or destructive. Through this process, the parents and school staff were able to utilize the five key principles of wellness, recovery, and resiliency to support Shauna and Jaden, and within a few weeks, they were back on track. A student who needs a crisis plan should also have a positive behavior support plan. If a child has challenges with behavior at school, the IEP team can be used to address those needs by using the information from the Functional Behavioral Assessment to develop a proactive and preventative plan that helps reduce and or eliminate the challenging behavior getting in the way of the student's learning. Positive behavioral interventions are planned interventions that take place before the onset of problem behaviors, before escalation of those behaviors, or to prevent the behaviors from reoccurring. Children's behavior is largely dependent on the behavior of others. How adults choose to intervene to stop or change a behavior gives a child cues about whether or not to try the same behavior under similar circumstances. When a general response to misbehavior is punishment without understanding why the behavior occurs in the first place, it is not possible to know whether the behavior being exhibited is positively reinforced. Consequences for behavior, whether positive or negative, must be personally meaningful to a child in order to reinforce or suppress that behavior. If it is possible to identify events in the environment that contribute to problem behavior, class size, teacher-child interactions, curriculum, medications, etc., it may be possible to modify those events sufficiently to inhibit or reduce the behavior. An important part of crisis planning includes thinking about the skills a child needs to better manage their behaviors. What is appropriate for the adults to expect? One example, escalating and crisis behaviors often begin with the demands or tasks in the school setting. We often expect a student to respond to an instruction given the first time they are told and in a very short time frame. But for kids with disabilities, it's important to establish their baseline response time and take into consideration their processing speed and receptive language skills. How quickly are they able to think about and understand what you just said? What accommodations and supports do we need to provide to help the child or youth stay regulated as they build those skills to reduce escalating behaviors? We might need to think about how we give instructions with everything from the tone of our voice to the way it is phrased. How many times does that student need to have it repeated and how much time do they need before they are able to respond appropriately? Another example, if a teacher knows, for instance, that Shauna becomes argumentative when seated next to a particular student because she and the student have a history of disagreements outside school, simply separating the two students may solve or partially solve the problem. If Shauna's arguments with her peer results from a lack of social skills, providing social skills instruction as part of her program may give Shauna the skills to get along with the student. Positive behaviors are taught and where necessary, retaught using the same strategies that are used in teaching academic skills. 
When children use the positive behavior skills that are expected, they are noticed, reinforced, or rewarded for using these skills. When they display negative behaviors, adults who work with children should impose consequences that make sense and that are meaningful to the child. As an example, if Jaden spray paints graffiti on a school wall, having him clean the wall is a consequence that is designed to help him understand the damage that spray paint does to an environment and the difficulty and expense of cleaning up after such damage. This is much more effective than suspension for teaching a desired behavioral skill. To best support a child or youth who experiences escalating and crisis level behaviors, we must first work to define what crisis means for that youth to be able to create appropriate interventions to keep everyone safe. Challenging our own assumptions will allow us to understand our role in impacting a child's behavior and to think more creatively about how we respond to support them. Remembering to build their skills by incorporating their strengths and interests, understanding and using the five keys of wellness and recovery when developing effective crisis plans, and applying person-centered principles empowers us to be proactive with the types of positive supports that can strengthen a child's recovery, as well as reducing the possibility of escalating behaviors. Lastly, like the IEP, behavior and crisis plans should be viewed as living documents that can be changed as needed throughout the school year to better meet the needs of the student. As we gain insight and experience working with a child and learn to better understand what they are communicating with their behaviors, we can start to address and respond to the needs rather than the behavior itself. Resiliency, recovery, and wellness is possible. Remember that definition of wellness is the presence of a positive purpose in life, satisfying work and play, joyful relationships, a healthy body, living environment, and happiness. Thank you all for joining me today. If you didn't put your questions in the chat, please do email them to me. I look forward to following up with you in part two, our live question and answer discussion.